Hey guys, I'm really excited because I have a really awesome guest. Uh, he is Anthony Fantano, the internet's busiest music nerd. He's uh, huge, got a huge channel, over 1.5 million subs on his main channel and uh, hundreds of millions of views. How's it going, man? Good, how are you? Uh, I'm doing well as well, man. I want to give you a big thanks for, uh, thanks for doing this. But uh, I want to start out because I don't think I've heard you talk about this. You know, what made you decide to start your channel and, you know, why did you decide to start it and how did it start out? Uh, I started my channel in super early 2009, I think maybe like exactly in January of 2009. Um, and I sort of started it as merely an experiment because for two years prior to that, the needle drop had already existed, but as a podcast and as a blog, uh, which I had been running off of uh, a server that was um, owned by the public radio station that I worked and interned at at the time. Uh, you know, I was doing some interning work over there, but also getting paid to do like some weekend announcing as well. Uh, I think eventually down the road. Um, I don't know if it was happening exactly at the time that I started my radio show, but I kind of digress on that. Um, so I was kind of doing that for a while, and uh, while it was really cool to kind of have that very slight touch of industry credibility, I mean, I think, you know, the the NPR connection kind of maybe got me like some album promos and uh, probably some interviews that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Uh, I still wasn't really making a career out of what I was doing. Um I, I think maybe I was uh, not fit for uh, that audience or something, or at least I, I knew that for the, the group of people who I wanted listening and watching, or I mean, again, not at that time watching, but listening or reading whatever I was doing, um, th those, those people, those young music listeners that I wanted to reach, they weren't really on you know, NPR, they weren't, really, they weren't really listening to NPR podcasts. And I'm like, okay, like how, how am I going to reach this group of people? I was already a huge fan of YouTube. Um, I guess at the time it just didn't really dawn on me to start a YouTube channel about music or music reviews. One, because there was no other channels out there from what I could see at the time doing it. And two, um, at the time I didn't really want to do album reviews. Like I didn't, so much see the point in album reviews. Mm. Uh, I had uh, uh, basically said to myself, I, I want to create the kind of content based around music that uh, I would want to consume, period. And that's essentially, uh, you just kind of turn people onto stuff and uh, just kind of play the song, give people a little bit of background and insight as to why it's good and what makes it special, and then just kind of move on, you know, kind of be a curator, be a tastemaker, you know, the, whether, whether or not you think it's bad, uh, doesn't matter quite as much at the end of the day. Um, when, you know, in fact, uh, when I started eventually dropping my opinions on YouTube, like that's exactly kind of hmm. <clears throat> the response I started getting a demand for it. Um, now of course, you know, it took a long time and, um, it was very slow going and it's, uh, very much still even now an uphill battle of sorts because the thing is like with, with, doing reviews and putting your opinions out there um it's it's very much a game of trust hmm. you know the thing is if somebody's stumbling across your channel for the first time period and they have no clue who the hell you are uh, even if you've managed to put out a good review because they're not familiar with you like they don't know whether or not to watch another review or trust you or you know you're just some random asshole it's like you know they, they have no reason to uh, believe anything that you say um but once somebody has kind of watch multiple reviews and they kind of get a feel for what your point of view or your taste is and you even maybe recommend to them something that they wouldn't have heard about otherwise and they love it um then you're getting closer to or you know you're quite possibly at that point where you've established trust so even though i was coming out with reviews since 2009 you know it's it's taken a while to get to where the brand is now but you know it's uh, with with things moving at the slow pace that they have uh, and kind of, you know, very gradually snowballing as time has gone on. Um, it's meant that in order to see more success out of what I'm doing, I don't necessarily have to work at it harder than I've always been. I mean, I've always been working at it hard, but now it's like the, the same amount of effort that I've 
pretty much always been putting into it, I see greater, you know, outcomes out of. Um, and again, this, this, uh, the YouTube channel started in 2009 because the podcast and the blog aren't really going anywhere. And this is kind of like a bit of a latch di- last ditch effort before I decided to, um, you know, fall back on my plan B and sort of, uh, go into either political reporting, um, or, uh, accounting, uh, which were kind of my, <laughs> my two, uh, my two fallbacks. Um, uh, if, if this whole, uh, music coverage thing didn't work out. So you say you started in 2009. So I remember first seeing videos from your channel back in, I think it was 2014 or 2015. And your channel was doing pretty well at the time. So wh- when did it start to take off and start to grow a lot? Which year was it? Um, you know, th- there was never one year where, like, hey, I just, like, all of a sudden had this explosive review drop. And then all of a sudden, like, from there on out, all my subscribers and all my views are, like, ten times or two times, even two times more than they were the previous week. I mean, I think maybe one of the biggest influx of subscribers I've ever gotten was probably for my um, Kendrick Two Pimp a Butterfly review. Mm, yeah, and uh, as far one. as, yeah, and, and as far as my views and my um, uh, subscribers were concerned, I mean, that very next week, once the original hype for the album had died down, uh, I mean, my traffic and everything pretty much went right back to where it was, except for maybe very, very slightly elevated. Um, which again is good because over the years I've seen so many YouTube channels that, you know, you get like this, this huge gigantic, like hit of viral success and it's explosive. It's, um, you know, at the time it almost seems like a sea change. And for a lot of people, um, who are kind of caught in the middle of that hype, I'm sure it seems like it because, uh, that moment can be so overwhelming, especially when you're, you're so unfamiliar with the way the game is played that, you know, this could be the new normal. Uh, but, you know, YouTube channels that um, were 10 times bigger than mine at the time and were at their peak probably three to five times bigger than my channel is right now, uh, you know, 2014, 2013, 2012 have completely disappeared. Mm-hmm. I mean, some of those channels are still on YouTube in like the top 1,000 channels in terms of subscribers, but they maybe net like a million or two views a month and that's it. Uh, there are quite a few dead old <laughs> channels on YouTube that are essentially like just dinosaurs at this point. Um, you know, and, and, and I think the longevity of what I'm doing is, is greatly attributed to, you know, not merely being reliant on, uh, viral success to, uh, to, to make what I'm doing work. Also consistency. Also, I don't have one of the younger fan bases on YouTube. I mean, there are certainly teenagers in my audience, but uh, for the most part, my viewership does kind of range from like maybe 16 to 35. So there are quite a few older listeners and viewers in my audience that um, you know aren't necessarily going anywhere anytime soon. Uh, it's not going to be like a, you know, like let's say Jake Paul for example. You know, nothing against the guy, but most of his fans and viewers are like 10, 12. And as soon as those kids are like 18, they're not still going to be fucking walking, watching Jake Paul. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, ultimately, like, I'm trying to – I'm not just trying to, like, make viral success here and then cash out. You know, I'm, like, trying to do this long term. I'm trying to get longevity out of this. I'm trying to build a name for myself. And I'm trying to compete with other music publications out there, but just on a completely different medium. And, um, you know, I, w- I would like to think I'm, I'm succeeding at that up until this point. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, did you ever envision yourself – uh, really at any point being having this big of a channel or this big of a following? You know, honestly, like, no, absolutely not. You know, I, I obviously wanted to uh, make money off of what I was doing and to kind of answer your previous question a little bit. You know, you were asking like, oh, what, what was this moment where things kind of exploded or, you know, some kind of significant, uh, you know, meaningful defining moment in the history of the channel? Um, I would say that for me was probably around 2012 when I was finally able to quit my restaurant job and just do this full time. Mm. Um, I had just moved into an apartment with my girlfriend at the time, now wife, and um, uh, you know we were we were scraping by a little bit. Um, you know I had to I had to like at that time like my diet, health, weight, everything like really went to shit because I was like pulling a lot of like 3 a.m. editing nights and everything. Uh, Just continue keeping up with the content demand. Um, 
you know, but obviously ended up kind of working out and getting better. And uh, my schedule is not nearly as arduous as it used to be when I initially kind of quit my job to focus on this. But again, when, when I could kind of focus on this full time, that was a defining moment. Um, but to sort of, uh, uh, go forward as far as imagining myself doing this, um, at the time, like when I was in high school or college, like, no, absolutely not. Like this was before the housing bubble popped and the internet kind of fully changed the media landscape as we know it. And I still envision myself going for a career in radio. And now that's like not really a, a viable thing or at least as viable as it, it used to be. Um, and, uh, beyond that, even when I started my YouTube channel, I had no idea what the, you know, potential ceiling for this sort of thing could be or could have been. I mean, right now at this moment, I kind of feel like potentially the sky is the limit. Like, I, I really don't know because the thing is like prior to me starting this channel, there was no community around this sort of thing. You know what I mean? There were a couple right. other guys, uh, uh, one of whom goes by the name of, um, your rhyme, right? Who was a Canadian guy. There was another guy, uh, who goes by the name of, uh, uh jumble junkie. Uh, there was another dude who, uh, Sammy Giroux, shout out to him who had a, a YouTube channel called the rocket out blog, like around that time, like that was it for the YouTube music coverage, reviewing, whatever you want to call it community. And, uh, you know, for a while, all, all four of us weren't even aware of one another's work and, um, you know, uh, eventually became aware of one another. But now there are like dozens and dozens and dozens of music review channels, music reaction channels. And um, it's all kind of like difficult to keep track of as of as of right now. So, I mean, you know, still to this day, I don't know entirely what the possibilities are. I mean, last week uh, or, you know, rather two weeks ago, I was just on um, you know, a tour through a bunch of major cities on the East Coast and the in the South, you know, and we went to Atlanta and Nashville and we sold out tickets in multiple places and we had hundreds of kids coming out to the shows and it was a total performance thing, you know, part like Ted talk, but also part like comedy bits as well that kind of made the kids all go crazy. And, uh, no, I never imagined that my YouTube channel would sort of put me in that position, take me to this place, you know, because the thing is like, because, because there's not a whole lot of, of, people out there I can point to, to kind of be like, Hey, that, that person did this. I'm going to copy that uh, because there's not a whole lot of examples out there being set for me. I'm just kind of figuring it all out as I go along, like what the possibilities are, what I can do, what I can't do, you know, what's good or bad content to make so on and so forth. I mean, I certainly have had my influences in the public radio and journalism world. I would like to owe a lot of my accuracy and, um, you know, uh, personal opinion standards to, you know, the journalistic uh, sort of atmospheres I kind of came up in um, because I, I would like to think that in that sense, I do take myself pretty seriously. Um, and also, uh, you know, coming up and seeing people like the angry video game nerd or, um, you know, on YouTube who sort of created this whole channel around his one passion, you know, was definitely an inspiration to me. If, you know, I definitely saw myself as being as passionate about music as he was about video games. Why couldn't I do the same thing for music? Um, and also on top of that, uh, you know, seeing people way back in the day, like Gary Vaynerchuk, who, you know, these, these days I, I don't, <laughs> uh, kind of buy into his whole, uh, motivational social media shtick. Um, as much as I used to back in the day, which I, I don't know if you're familiar with his work at all. Are, are you aware of Gary Vaynerchuk? No, I, I don't know who that is. He He's this dude who way back in the day, in the 2000s, he used to run a website uh, based off of this, uh, uh, basically this, this like liquor store that he used to run with his dad. And he had a, YouTube, he had like a, you know, a web show called Wine Library TV. Now I don't drink, I don't know fucking anything about wine. But this dude would, like, review all these wines, and it would be the most entertaining fucking thing. Now, again, like, I don't know anything about wine. I hate stuffy suburbanite, like, upper crust pieces of garbage who probably, like, just drink the stuff like it's water. Um, but his approach to just talking about wine and uh, sort of ingesting it and kind of reviewing it was just so... Uh, electrifying and entertaining you couldn't not like appreciate it even if you're sort of on the outside if you're somebody who is uh, obsessed with 
something, anything like you can appreciate kind of seeing that passion come out of another person. And and nowadays he's just kind of like a social media guru who kind of grifts uh, rich people out of their money by doing consulting work for <laughs> them because he's like, Hey, look at me. You know, it's, I respect the hustle. I respect the hustle. But the thing is like, it's, it's, you know, it's not as interesting to me as, as what he used to do. I know he needed to kind of transcend out of that to probably make the the millions of dollars he's uh, he's making today or at least i would like to think at least he puts up that facade successfully <laughs> um but uh, uh but back in the day like you know sort of seeing people like gary seeing people like uh the angry video game nerds sort of turn these things that they were passionate about into their internet livelihood through a series through a web show through a something that was that was inspiring to me and that sort of drove me to to what I'm doing today, and again, I'm still kind of figuring it all out as I as I go along. I feel like uh, I feel like like music review culture per se is sort of I don't know. I think it's sort of almost centered around you. I feel like, and I think that's because you have one of the most what I would call like active fan bases that I've seen, and you know, there's all the the melon memes, and I know that you embrace it. Uh, when did that start coming to fruition? Because I don't recall that, or at least maybe it wasn't as as con uh, as constant as we see it today. I don't recall that back in 2014 or 2015. Um, there always has been kind of an element of of meme culture surrounding what I'm doing because I remember back in the day. I mean, there definitely were fo photoshops that I would share. Um, I know that I had a huge. Uh, following at the time on the music board on 4chan, uh, <laughs> which which back in the day was not quite as bad as it is, as it is these days. Um, you know, I, I think uh, part of the reason that that is is that um, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, 4chan. I think a lot of the creativity that originally was uh, on that site has kind of matriculated off onto other platforms on the internet, and you know, that's it. It kind of sucks to sort of see. Um, the website kind of be a, a shell of what it once was. I mean, the people who, you know, used to run it and own it don't even own and run it anymore. And it's just like, you know, it's, it's, it's not the same vibe. It's not the same culture. It's not the same anything anymore. It's, it's, you know, it, I, I still think it's, it's nice that it's still standing there as an institution and it's good for a laugh every once in a while, but it's not kind of like the, um, the guiding force in, in meme culture that it used to be. And I had a huge following on the music board. Um, and I used to actually go on there back in college quite a bit. Uh, I had sort of lost touch with it when I was um, kind of uh, uh, putting a lot of the groundwork into the needle drop that I needed to. And um, one day I started a... a prepping for a particular review uh it was the uh, radiohead kings of limbs review and um in in my comments i would routinely get um you know requests for albums and everything like that hey review this album review that album review this other album um <clears throat> but uh, i started to get these comments that were saying like hey you better review that new Radiohead album ASAP or else MU is going to fucking come get you. <laughs> like you better, you better review that Radiohead album or, you know, M, you know, you're done on MU or, you know, Mew, like we're going to get you, we're going to kill you, blah, 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 blah. Like, of course it's all pretty much said in jest. But, um, uh, so that, that forced me to be like, what the hell is going on over there? Like I haven't been there in a while. So I went on there and like almost every other fucking threads about me. <laughs> and it's either people like hating on me or complimenting me or um just this one weird troll thread that people would post routinely which would always like result in hundreds of posts and hundreds of responses where uh, they would post the same photo of me uh in the middle of reviewing this group called holy ghost and it would just be like this weird kind of smarmy look on my face and the post would always say what do you guys think of anthony fantano like that thread would happen multiple times a day on the board at one point like earlier in the decade. And I was just like, you know, uh, flabbergasted as to, you know, why they'd be writing about me all the time and talking about me all the time. Um, and uh, so I kind of responded to that with kind of an appearance from a character where I just kind of like turned a white shirt inside out and I wrote MU on it and I had like a baseball bat in my hand and I was kind of threatening to beat myself up as this character if I didn't kind of give that record a good review or give it a review um, sooner rather than later. 
And uh, in, in a way that even though, again, there were photoshops and there were definitely people who would kind of gripe and groan over scores repeatedly. And that be kind of came, became a little joke in the comments around that time. Uh, but in a way that kind of opened the floodgates a little bit because I had I had acknowledged the existence of the meme oh, community no. and the fact that there's like a meme contingent hanging out in the comment section. And then it gave them like this note of self-awareness. In, in the comments because they're like, whoa, like he sees us, we see him, and now we're aware of our own existence collectively <laughs> within, the, <laughs> within the fan base. Um, <clears throat> so then from there, you know, it, again, it sort of opened up these meme floodgates. And, and so then there were like even more Photoshops and even more jokes. And the Radiohead album, I ended up giving it like a six. And of course, like just the score of the album in and of itself became like a joke. Uh, because, you know, there's like this huge running gag that if an album is big or important or relevant, I'm going to give it a six. Like, it's got to get a six. And, um, you know, I'm the six guy or the six god or the six melon or whatever. Um, so, I mean, that's that's probably where, like, the again, the meme contingent in my audience became self-aware. Uh, as, as far as, like, the origin of, I mean, there are lots of different memes, but as far as, like, the melon one, um, the origins of that meme, and it's been going on for so long that a lot of newer audience members like kind of have totally lost touch with where it came from, and they don't even know. They just kind of see other people saying it, and they see that I have a big round head, so they say it too. Um, but where it originally came from was this electronic music producer by the name of Zombie, who has kind of a history of um, uh, uh, attacking both verbally and even physically, um, you know, other. Uh, musicians music journalists so on and so forth and he would repeatedly go on like these twitter tirades when a review of his was like less than favorable or less than uh uh accurate and he would also uh delete them immediately after um and uh i did a review of, of one of his records and he went on exactly one of those tirades about me and uh, at the very end of the whole tirade which people were just kind of loving and laughing at because it was just so over the top and just so angry um, he just called me a melon, you know, he just called me a fucking melon. And, uh, and people were kind of like clowning the fact that he had called me a melon because it made no fucking sense. And it was so weird. Um, it was just such an odd insult to end like this whole, like screed off with, and all my fans were kind of just like making fun of him and breaking his balls. And then of course he deleted the whole thing. But then afterwards, all of them started calling me melon, like <laughs> affectionately because they thought the whole tirade was really funny. Um, so from then on, I was kind of known as, as, uh, the melon. And it's funny, even after like, um, that whole tirade, while the melon thing did become a meme, it wasn't even as big of a meme as it is now with like less of a connection to the origins of that whole meme. I feel like people use it, use that terminology now even more than they did like, uh, back in 2012, 13, 14, uh, back when, back when that was originally said. <laughs> That's super interesting. I didn't know that story either. I just see a bunch of people saying melon and sort of a big meme. Yes, it's totally disconnected at this point. It's funny. <laughs> I think it's 100% disconnected. But um, so getting into music here, I just kind of want to segue in. Uh, you know, the Pusha T and Drake beef happened. Now, mm. I have seen some of your stuff on that, but, I'll, you know, I was wondering if you could just sort of lay out what your thoughts were on the beef, you know, who won and, you know, just the progression of it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's kind of indicative of just rap beef not being quite what it used to be. I think Pusha T tried to bring it back in that direction. Um, but unfortunately, like, there, look, there, there's just like too much at stake uh, for a lot of people, especially with hip hop being as huge as the zeitgeist culturally that it currently is. Um, there are a lot of people whose entire financial livelihoods depend on Drake. And um <laughs> Ultimately, it's not really worth it for him to, uh, even if he does end up winning, you know, after like maybe the fifth or sixth diss track, if it takes that long to make it happen. Um, it's not really worth it, even if he ends up winning and getting the cred at the end of the day, uh, for him to put at risk his credibility, his album sales, his um, image in the industry. And also, you know, as we have seen uh exemplified uh in in 
you know, past instances, your life as well. I mean, and we don't even have to go as far back as like Biggie and Tupac to illustrate that. You know, I mean, uh, just recently, one of the most popular contemporary hip hop artists out there right now, XX to X Tentacion, got gunned down uh, in broad daylight. Um, you know, and there's currently like a weird beef going on between Takashi Six Nine and Chief Keef, which potentially could go south at some point. I don't fucking know. Um, you know, and, and there's also kind of like all of these uh, weird intra uh, sort of feuds going on, or at least were going on much more uh, regularly in the Chicago scene uh, for a while, where you know there were a lot of uh, attacks as a result of uh, uh, what artists were saying about each other in their songs or over social media and that sort of thing. Um, so because the money is at stake, like Drake, Drake's not going to stick his neck out, especially since Pusha T's response to the whole Duppy freestyle thing, like really put a whole, I, I mean, really just like a stake through the heart of his image through that uh, Adidas, uh, Adidas um, uh, promotional campaign that he had running. Like he really just embarrassed the dude. And I don't even know where he found this information out. Drake's team seemed like really confused as to how he learned this information uh, as well. But the thing is, I, I think a lot of people are sort of at that level of fame and money and so on and so forth. They think because the whole world is looking at them and because uh, they're so popular, they probably assume that they're the world that they exist in is probably larger than it actually is. When in fact, everybody kind of knows about each other. Um, everybody kind of knows each other's BS. Um, you know, even the world of music journalism is super duper duper small like the major, major players, there aren't that many of them. And uh, a lot of the PR companies that kind of work things behind the scenes, like there's even fewer of them. Um, so it's, 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 it's kind of a very small community. It's a very small contingent. So it, it doesn't surprise me that um, somebody like Pusha T uh, would have the information about Drake that he did and most likely have it locked and loaded when he did eventually respond to Drake on uh, that story of Addy Don. Uh, track, you know that that whole line that he dropped about Drake on infrared, uh, where he was talking about Drake being uh, sort of singing "Mammy," basically sort of portraying him as like this this old sort of you know blackface type stereotype in his lyric. I have no doubt that when he wrote that lyric, like he had that picture ready, he had those lyrics he ready. Had like, to have. He had to have. He had to have had all of that ready, and and uh, uh, again, you know, we sort of see with the way that Drake responded with merely just an Instagram story post in text, uh, sort of basically trying to explain away the picture, which, you know, as I said in my video coverage of it, like, yeah, it doesn't look very good, but mostly because of the way that Pusha T, like, um, was able to frame the picture by taking it out of context. You know, I mean, Drake, at the end of the day, he, he is a black artist and he was a black actor, and it's certainly within his right to uh, sort of try to make the, the social statement that, um, he was attempting to at the time, but also I think another reason that maybe people didn't take the picture so seriously is that um, Drake, Drake doesn't really talk about social issues anymore. <laughs> you know what I mean? Sort of a, uh, I mean, it's quite the opposite. Uh, you know, I personally have have found some of his um, uh, some of his lyrics to kind of reek of um, I don't know classism a little bit. Like now that he's successful, like he kind of poo poos. Uh, people who are, you know, poorer or from lesser means than him every once in a while, uh, which I find kind of obnoxious. Um, whereas, like, you know, as successful as somebody like Pusha T is, you know, I sort of see him as as being someone who's still very much in touch with uh, with where he came from. Though that, you know, again, that's not exclusive to to the whole Drake situation. I mean, we could even talk about how Kanye West is totally off the rails right now at this at this very moment in in some respects. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, for the most part, I think Pusha T definitely came out on top of that beef. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, I, I think Drake, Pusha T, unfortunately, is not really capable of kind of ending Drake's career, you know. Uh, and, and again, I guess not that I uh, sort of wish for that to happen. Um, but uh, but I guess, you know, as, as, uh, as detrimental as I'm sure the whole thing was to Drake's wallet in some respects, um, Drake very much appeals to a very different audience than Pusha T does. And uh, while it was like a really nasty diss track, at the end of the day, if Drake just writes a bunch of kind of moany, basic, catchy songs uh, that people want to hear, like people are going to listen to them. Um, and, and I think on top of it, like the industry... <clears throat> is so behind like forcing this Drake thing down our throats, even though he's not really writing the best material of his career. Um, 
which is definitely exemplified with the whole way that uh, Spotify treated the album rollout, which I don't know if you followed that very closely, but um, if you went to the front page of Spotify the day Scorpion was released, Drake was on the front page, the front picture, the front cover of every fucking <laughs> playlist on the front page. He was on the front of the indie playlist and the UK hip hop playlist, which makes <laughs> no fucking sense. Like, he was on the front of playlists that he had no business being on the front of. Uh, Spotify actually gave some paid subscribers uh, refunds uh, for their subscription <laughs> who were annoyed by the fact that they couldn't sort of just go on the front page of Spotify and continue to use the service as they normally would. Uh, but the thing is, like, Spotify, at the end of the day, they want to turn a profit. Uh, and they know they want to do it off of Drake. Drake wants to turn a profit. Uh, maybe there's some kind of payola going on there. Who the hell knows? Um, you know, because the thing is, like, there's absolutely no regulation whatsoever when it comes to uh, uh, this sort of thing when it comes to streaming platforms. Like, certainly uh, the rules are there when it comes to uh, the terrestrial airwaves. But I think over the years, um, uh, record labels and PR people have kind of figured out ways around that since uh, radio eventually anyway started just like playing the first fifth, the, the same 15 songs over and over and over and over. Um, but, uh, but clearly there's another kind of level of collusion going on now between these streaming platforms and, and major artists out there uh, because they're really kind of shoving this shit down our throats when it's not that good. Hmm. That's interesting. So you think there's a sort of collusion going on? I mean, there used to be collusion with radio stations and artists too, where, you know, Hot 97 wouldn't play Ether, they wouldn't play Nas' music at the time. So that's something that's sure. interesting, actually. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely think there is something going on on that level. Um, you know, certainly there, there's been no effort to kind of curb this beha curb this behavior when it's come to streaming services paying artists for exclusivity to that album for a certain week or a number of weeks or whatever. Um, I can't imagine that uh, uh, if things were to go in the other direction that the, the that uh, um, government agencies would would pay any mind to it. Okay, uh, so I have something that I wanted to uh, say, and I want to see what your thoughts are on this because. I feel like, uh, you know, hip hop rap in general has gone downhill from hmm. uh, the 90s and, and the, you know, earlier 2000s. Uh, I feel like, you know, we've gone from, you know, obviously Nas, Biggie, Tupac, and, you know, all, all the other, you know, great rappers hmm. to now having more, you know, we have Chief Keef and we have Drake and, you know, all these other guys. And I feel like hip hop has really gone downhill in terms of its quality. Uh, I also feel like music now is more, it's lyrics sort of take a backseat to we need a good beat. And mm. I feel like it's just of lower quality nowadays. And I find myself just listening to a lot of 90s music still. Uh, and so I want to know what, what you think about that and how you feel about that, whether or not it's sort of taken a, a downturn. And I know because you, you just went absolutely to town on Lil <laughs> Zan's Total Xanarchy. So, you know... I want to know your thoughts. My thoughts generally on, on like the current state of the quality of rap music. I, I think what a lot of people don't quite understand because the, the current meta of rap music makes things so chaotic and hectic because things are so popular. The dust hasn't settled yet and we haven't quite put two and two together as to like why things are shifting artistically and lyrically and so on and so forth. I mean, I'll start this off first by saying I think there is still a lot of great music out there. I still think there is a lot of great talent out there. And I do my best to review it and elevate it um, when I can. One of my favorite records this year is, is uh, you know, a hip-hop album. I mean, there are multiple ones so far this year. But uh, one of my favorites, which certainly stands out, is um, uh, the new JPEG Mafia album, uh, Veteran which is a really great experimental, kind of noisy, abrasive, very punk-influenced uh, hip-hop record, uh, which I recommend to anybody who, you know, is trying to get into newer stuff or would like to try out some newer stuff, um, you know, wants to hear something that's, like, cutting edge and more thoughtful than a little Xan album. Uh, but the thing is, like, with hip-hop music being as popular, being as mainstream, being as dominant over current musical culture as it is, you're going to get a flood. You're going to get an influx of people who aren't really making great music uh, because they're merely just kind of popping in to chase after the trend, and that's it. Um, you know, there are certainly examples of this in the past with other genres of music and music movements like disco, like hair metal, uh, like synthesizer pop and new wave. Um, 
I'll also say uh, grunge and post grunge. Like if Nirvana had not become this watershed moment in music, you wouldn't fucking have Nickelback. You wouldn't have Creed, um, you know, and, and uh, not to say, uh, and I'm talking about other sort of influencers in that genre as well, you know, not just Nirvana, but also Pearl Jam, so on and so forth. But immediately after those groups, like you had all these really crappy, watered down, terrible bands that were just dropping these awful single puddle of mud um, who just in terms of like rock music, just absolute trash. There's like nothing redeeming about what they were doing whatsoever and, and are slowly going to just be completely forgotten in the, uh, <laughs> the, the tomes of, of rock history because they weren't significant. They weren't important. They were just merely creating a lesser version of something, uh, out of a more significant wave earlier in the nineties. Um, so the thing is like once, once something becomes a very basic ass repetitive, um, easy to profit off of formula, which trap music right now very much is. Like you're going to get an influx of artists who just basically pop in. They're writing the catchiest, most mediocre, most basic ass, lowest common denominator music that they could possibly think of. And they're hoping to just make kind of a quick buck or a quick career out of it and then just disappear uh, you know, as soon as it's all kind of over. And um, right now, uh, hip hop is kind of just in the middle of that very awkward growing pain. You know, it's it's in the middle of that growing pain right now. Um, like, again, like many other genres before it. Uh, and I don't, unfortunately, you know, it's, while it kind of sucks to acknowledge, uh, I just kind of feel like it's, it's a bit of a fact of life. Um, but that's not to say that there isn't quality music being released. There is. You just need to kind of dig for it a little bit. And, um, you know, fortunately, what makes things different now in the internet age, there's not really a demand for any particular sound or idea or style uh, in music to die out completely. Like, you know, you say that you're kind of going back, listening to this 90s stuff. Um, and there's still plenty of artists out there who come out with music and they're contemporary artists whose sound is very much indebted to that whole 90s vibe. And, and even some artists are on an 80s thing uh, every once in a while. But, you know, I, th I think to artists like your old Droog, um, I think to artists like Joey Badass, uh, two very new, very contemporary artists whose whole sound sort of revolves around that 90s thing. Um, and because the internet doesn't really truly let anything die, even if you wanted to go out there onto a platform like Bandcamp or you know, maybe even some other platform too, you can still find people making bluegrass music. You can still find people making outlaw country. You can still find people making like 90s era drum and bass and jungle and shit. Um, nothing really ever truly dies on the internet, you know, it's, uh, uh but the mainstream is going to do what the mainstream is going to do. Okay. So that, so that I, I do see what you're saying and I think it, you know, there's still, there still are good quality, good quality rappers. I still think that people like J Cole and Kendrick are pretty good, but it's harder to sure. find good artists is kind of the way I put it. Um, yeah. but mm -hmm. I wanted to move into, uh, you know, talking about your political leanings, so I sort of have a feel for where you fall on the political spectrum, but I think it'd be best if I just sort of let you explain, you know, what your political leanings are. Yeah, I mean, I, I to kind of put it bluntly, I would say I'm uh, very much probably like a, a Bernie Krat, uh, progress type progressive, and and probably uh, probably leave it at that. You know, a, a lot of the. Um, policy positions that I see people kind of touting on the, uh, uh, the progressive wing currently, you know, we're talking, um, uh, free, uh, education at public, uh, colleges. So we're talking Medicare for all or single payer, um, uh, ending the, you know, foreign interventions and all the needless foreign wars overseas, um, more infrastructure spending, you know, fixing problems here at home, like the Flint water crisis, that sort of thing. Um, you know, ending this super abusive um, approach that we take to uh, uh, immigrants at the border, uh, especially going on right now. Um, the the list goes on and on. You know all the talking points. You know, but uh, uh, for those uh, uh, for those issues, I'm pretty passionate and um, care a great deal. And uh, and that's kind of where uh, uh, my political leanings have been set a long time. I mean, you could either ca call me that, you know, sort of label me as that, or I guess internationally. You could probably call me, you know, uh, on the international stage, maybe even a centrist, because I feel like part of the way to kind of 
soften the blow of these ideas, which are often just kind of portrayed as being super left wing, super out of the realm of possibility, super just not sensible, uh, is that every other country out there, every other first world developed country, and even some countries that aren't that developed and in the first world, uh, have these amenities. <laughs> And they, they invest in their populace. They invest in the education. They invest in the health of their citizens. Um, and we don't seem to, to get that same benefit. Um, we're just kind of being worked to death, unfortunately. Um, and we're kind of just uh, uh, medicating ourselves with uh, um, out-of-control drug addictions and, uh, you know, overeating and just really kind of eating really shitty processed food. I mean, we have like a weight problem in this country as well. Like a lot of other first world countries don't. And, and I think it partially stems from, uh, uh, the, the stress of kind of being ground into the economic system of the United States of America. Um, you know, also, uh, of course we absolutely deserve a, a, a a police or a, a law enforcement arm of the government that doesn't uh, abuse people uh, and take advantage of people and, and kill people uh, uh, as well, um, you know, especially unarmed people. Um, but, uh, you know, again, to, to soften the blow of some of these issues, I think it's important to acknowledge that, like, on the international stage, these are super moderate positions. The idea that the taxes that we pay should be spent back on us as a populace to things that benefit us by our actual government, I think is a really common sense position. Uh, it's certainly better than blowing all of that money on bank bailouts or corporate welfare or uh, hundreds of military bases across the world or uh, you know one endless war in a country that most people can't find on a map after another, after another, after another. Um, so those are kind of, those are kind of the positions that I'm, that I'm passionate about. And I'm, you could even bring up some other ones if, uh, if I forgot to mention anything that you're curious about. How would you rate the Trump presidency on a scale of zero to 10? The Trump presidency, the, the issue I have with not so much Trump, but the way people react to Trump is look, I'm, I'm old enough to vividly remember the Bush years. Like I went to numerous protests against the Iraq war um, I absolutely hated George Bush. Uh, it was like the first election that I could vote in. And, uh, you know, I voted against him, voted for Gore, so on and so forth. Um, and to me, what Trump is doing as far as like, um, uh, you know, just his policies, as far as like just the way he legislates, it's not really that much different than the neocons of the 2000s. And it is a little aggravating to to – sort of see a lot of people kind of react to Trump as basically like this uh, super crazy sea change in right-wing politics. And in some ways he is in the fact that he's just so not civil and acts like a total piece of trash and, um, you know, just doesn't know how to act like a, uh, I, I guess like um, a functional human being. Um, but the thing is like, is, is, as far as the way he governs, like this is kind of another, this is standard Republican bullshit. And I feel like we'd be doing ourselves a disservice if we were to act like all the terrible things about Trump, of which there are many of, uh, and, and I'm talking merely about the way that he governs and legislates and, and runs, uh, the executive branch and, and also the way that he hires, uh, you know, people like Scott Pruitt, so on and so forth. Um, you know, putting putting someone like Scott Pruitt in the position that he's in is is a long time Republican um, uh, strategy. You know that that's nothing new. That's nothing new. That's not inventive. That's not reinventing the wheel. That's not a new thing. Um, but uh, I think we'd be doing ourselves a disservice if we were to act like the problem is Trump. The problem solely is Trump, and. If we do that to ourselves, as soon as he's gone, we're going to trick ourselves once again into thinking that, well, you know, once we get another Democrat in, which it's going to be like the Bush thing all over again. You know, I mean, Obama was uh, a great statesman and, um, you know, really good at getting himself elected. Um, but the thing is, uh, uh, he didn't do a whole lot in terms of guiding the the message and the principles of the Democratic Party. Um and as a result, I think the Democrats kind of lost touch, lost message, uh, lost direction. And um, we were so traumatized after Bush 
it was like really anybody but Bush at this point. Like, give us anybody. Give us anybody that's better than Bush and we'll be happy. Because toward the end of the Bush years, even Republicans hated his guts. Um, you know, the, the kind of vitriol you see against Trump now, and he still does have quite a bit of support within his base, but the kind of vitriol you see against Trump now is very much nearly the same level of negativity that people had for George Bush generally toward the very end of his presidency. And uh, I think because of just how terrible that was, uh, people were just willing to accept anything that the other side of the aisle handed us because uh, it would be better to some degree. And Obama, he was. He was, even though he did continue to expand on foreign interventions, the drone program, you know, NSA spying, didn't take out the Patriot Act, didn't close Guantanamo Bay like he promised he would uh, his first week in office. Um, even though socially and uh, societally, uh, I think Obama was was certainly uh, a better moment in history for this country than Bush was, um, it wasn't really the change that um, he basically built his entire campaign on, you know, because that was that was the slogan. That was the meme as it was. You know, you saw multiple pictures of Obama in red, beige, and blue imagery with change under his head, hope under his head. Um, but in retrospect, it's just kind of like, wow, I hoped things changed, but they didn't. Um, so I kind of worry that the vitriol toward Trump and just Trump, and not just the Republicans at large, not just the system giving us Trump, uh, the system putting us on a track to where Trump seemed palatable, uh, the system that that puts uh, hatred on the ballot, but not ending the wars, not ending corporate welfare, not giving people Medicare, not uh, giving kids uh, a decent education. Uh, you know, you can you can vote for somebody on the ballot who wants to put up a wall, but there's no option on the ballot, a viable option anyway, if you care about uh, the Israel-Palestine situation. Because, you know, no matter which mainstream candidate you voted for in that situation, we're still going to continually just send blank checks over to Israel as if they're not doing anything <laughs> uh, against international law. Um, so I, I, I sort of warn people, you know, whatever the Democrats try to hand us this next time around as an answer to Trump, don't just take it and assume everything's hunky-dory and everything's fine because this whole mindset of voting for the lesser of two evils has put us in this situation. Uh, because if we just continually vote for the lesser of two evils, that allows the Republicans to slide further to the right and further to the right and further to the right each time. Because uh, and, and the Democrats historically have been sliding further to the right as well to kind of catch up because they want to make a lot of the same corporate uh, money that the Republicans do. And as a result, um, because of that mentality, the, the, the bar that we've set for what makes a viable political candidate on the opposition side is so low. All you have to do is be better than Trump. Well, motherfucker, anybody's better than Trump. So it's like, you know, you could literally put Mitt Romney in office tomorrow and he'd be better than Trump. It would be fucking terrible in the grander scheme of things. And it is a terrible choice, but it would be slightly less traumatizing and upsetting and volatile than having Trump in office. So, again, when when you're when your position is anybody but the guy who's in there right now, like you're you're doomed to be on a path of self-destruction because you're not actually doing anything for yourself. You're not actually fighting for anything at that point. It's not a it's not a principled position. You know, I, I get that Trump is is bad. I get that you know he's toxic. I get that he's poisonous. I get that he's bad for the system. But so is the mentality that that gave him to us too. So, how did you feel about Hillary Clinton and her campaign and why she lost? I mean, Hillary Clinton. I didn't really care for her that much, again, merely because she didn't really give voters anything to truly be excited about. Um, the whole Democratic campaign was basically, we're not Trump. Like, that was pretty much their position. And the thing is, like, that's that's not going to excite anybody. You know, the thing is, like, as detestable as Trump's views are, he was actually offering things to <laughs> people 
uh, who were voting for him. You know, he was uh, uh, offering bigots the wall. He was uh, trying to offer Midwesterners, hey, you know, I'll do these uh, economic protections and I want to bring jobs back and blah, 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 blah. Like, of course, like he was just blowing smoke up people's asses. But it seemed like Hillary couldn't even be bothered to do that to some degree. Um, you know, to me, Hillary obviously would have been the better choice than Trump. Um, again, as, as lackluster as a candidate as she was, but I think a lot of the reason that she lost is just the, and this could have a lot to do with the DNC as well. Um, but the campaign was just run really badly. Like the messaging was bad. The messaging was bland. The platform you know, especially after Bernie Sanders kind of added some stuff to it with his reconciliation, uh, you know, and sort of bowing out of the race, the platform was okay. But the thing is like that, that platform, they were doing very little to promote that platform. So it's like, while well, you could go on the website and see the platform and like, okay, you know, it seems all right. You know, it's, it's like maybe a bit of progress in the right direction. Like what, what are we doing to message this platform and put it front and center and and make sure that everybody knows about it and is aware of it. You know, the thing is, like, it seems like whenever something goes down, like, let's take uh, this this recent um, uh, immigration situation, for example, where, you know, you have the separation of the kids from their family, so on and so forth. It seemed almost like fucking overnight the Republicans had this running narrative all over social media and even in, in the news as well, where it's just like, well... I'm a soldier and I get separated from my family too. So not really that big of a deal. Uh, and everybody was fucking saying that everybody was repeating that shit. The left doesn't seem to have that. <laughs> and, and it's mostly because <clears throat> our key politicians and, and again, it's uh, to, to sort of preface before I say this, I don't really think it has anything to do with the base or uh, the roots of the, of the party, the voter base, not caring. Uh, but the thing is like, there's very little in the way of focus uh, being handed to us by our mainstream politicians on the opposing party, by uh, the news media uh, of the opposing party in terms of like, okay, what's like a good response to this really shitty narrative? Uh, they, they don't seem to have one. It's like they just don't answer. Like when shit like that happens, when stuff like that goes down, you don't see Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer getting out in front of it on the Sunday shows on TV and saying, hey, like, here's actually what it is. Here's ABC and A. Here's our plan. To, here's our plan to, to deal with it. Uh, in fact, when it comes to be crunch time, like when it came time to protect the dreamers uh, and the Democrats had the government shut down, basically had the Republicans by the balls instead of like digging their heels in the dirt, standing their ground and living up to their promise to help dreamers and help immigrants. They just folded off of this promise by Mitch McConnell, which he later broke to say, oh, well, you know, we'll we'll talk about it eventually. You know, we'll, we'll address this down the road at some point, you know, not even a promise to like, OK, we'll do we'll work on some legislation about it right now. Or, hey, you know, we uh, give you A, B, C and D on this front if you let the government run again. Or, you know, we'll give up X, Y and Z if you just, you know, let things go as is and, you know, not embarrass us by having the government shut down. And there was absolutely no reason for them to give up at that point, because as as polling had showed. Like the public was very much convinced that all of this, the, the shutdown, everything was the Republicans fault. So, I mean, this was easily something the, the, the Democrats could have held on to and could have countered the Republican narrative of in the, in the mainstream media. Uh, but the thing is, because the media and the Democrats are basically bought and paid by the same corporations and special interests that the Republicans are, like, of course, they're not going to play hardball. Of course, they're not going to, you know, take them to the mat on stuff like that. So, you know, there's very little in, in the way of a guiding narrative uh, coming from uh, our mainstream politicians on the left outside of Russia and Stormy Daniels that is likely to win over independent voters, likely to win over voters on the other side, and likely to change the tide of opinion uh, when Republicans come out with a narrative like that. A narrative like, oh, well, I'm a soldier and I get separated from my kids, so no big deal. Uh, who would you, who do you think would be the best candidate for the Democratic nominee in 2020 to be able to defeat Trump? <sighs> I mean, like, I would, I would like to just say Bernie, and, and I think that he would give Trump a run for his money, and he would, and he would, um, 
you know, it'd certainly have a fighting chance. And I think, you know, if he had been allowed to run against Trump originally, I think he most likely would have won because he would have been issues oriented. Um, you know, however, America does have kind of this thing against uh, against losers, against people who lose. It's almost like if you lost in a previous election, you're less viable as a candidate now. Um, you know, I, I, I think beating Trump, again, is 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 going to be easy because he has made the country detest him so much. You're probably going to throw anybody in his way, even a Kamala Harris or a Cory Booker. And it's probably going to be a walk in the park, especially if they throw a few things out there like, hey, you know, Medicare for all and kind of hammer it and, uh, you know, hammer on the corruption and that sort of thing. Like, I, I think it's going to be uh, simple, you know, for the Democrats to kind of walk in and not have to be too issue oriented and rely mostly on how awful Trump is to kind of get a, a, a win out of this. Um, what's unfortunate and this is this is a part of you know a sign that the Democratic Party is is pretty broken, is that they have done such a terrible job. And this was also the case during the 2016 campaign, you know, or rather the primary on the Democratic side. Very clearly, um, they have done such a terrible job of grooming new talent. They've done an awful job of grooming new talent, and the leadership is aging. The leadership is irrelevant. Like the even the key players, like you know, uh, that which which is partially why it was so. I'm not going to say easy because she put the work in, um, but which is why it was so possible for uh, Ocasio Cortez to kind of pull the upset that she did. That's your number four guy in the Democratic <laughs> Party, the guy who is slated to replace Nancy Pelosi if she falls out, and nobody even knows who the fuck he is. Like, that's who we're supposed to be excited about as far as, like, ooh, what, what talent's bubbling up in the Democratic Party right now? Like, Joseph Crowley? Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> like, you know, Cortez is somebody who people are actually excited about, people who people actually care about, um, who people actually want to see win and who people actually see see her representing their values and their interests and, and their own well-being. You know, nobody looks at somebody like Joe, Ca Joe, Joe Crowley and, and sees that. Um so, I mean, frankly, I would like to, you know, see more Ocasio-Cortez type wins. I would like to see more people who are sort of on the Justice Democrat ticket uh, sort of making noise and uh, uh, pulling upsets. Um, you know, th there are interesting uh, names and faces in in the Democratic Party um, bubbling up, but they're, they're very much sort of on that kind of outsider progressive uh, uh, side of the party, um, you know, like Rokana, uh, or, um, you know, who's, who's that representative from Hawaii? What's her name? She's very uh, good. Tulsi Gabbard. Yeah. Tulsi Gabbard is great. Um, she's fantastic. Uh, you know, I, I would, I would love to, to, to see more people like them taking power positions in the party and kind of getting out there more in the news media because, you know, now that there's more of them in power as a result of like the, this recent series of elections, I would like to see a lot of them kind of, uh, as much as I know they have to try to, you know, do their jobs as legislators, they can't just, you know, spend the whole time, uh, uh, you know, out to lunch uh, trying to make a name for themselves and create a media circus. But um, I would love to see a lot of them getting out there more in front of television cameras like Bernie Sanders has over the past couple of years because, you know, right now, as important as it is to get out there, get in Congress, get in local legislatures, you know, get in locally elected positions and uh, basically fight these battles on the front lines, I feel like there's also a battle of hearts and minds going on here that we really have to fight if we're going to make any headway. Because as important as it is to have somebody like Tulsi Gabbard um, in the position that she's in, um, we need to be doing more to get in front of, you know, these television cameras and and make our case and, uh, you know, let it be known what exactly we're fighting for, why we're fighting for it, so that American people know out there that that option is on the table. Like, a lot of people don't consider this stuff because the news media doesn't present it to them. You know, you get boneheaded segments like um, that idiot Chris Cuomo uh, interviewing Bernie Sanders uh, in front of the whiteboard, and he's like, well, people say uh, uh, Medicare for all, that's socialism and squiggly letters. And it's like, he's saying like every stupid 
talking point. And maybe to a degree you could argue that, hey, you know, he's just playing devil's advocate a little bit. But his positions were so asinine and ridiculous that you could kind of tell that he didn't really have that much of a grasp of, of the situation either. Um, <laughs> so, you know, the thing is, like, I, I – we and and the politicians that we elect who are on the progressive end of things have to understand that the news media is not going to do us any favors in terms of like getting our positions out there and getting the message out there and explaining to people why this stuff works and why it works in other countries and why it makes sense and why, again, these positions are not extreme. Um, we need to be making that case. Uh, we can't rely on the news media to do it. We can't rely on corporate Democrats to do it. We can't rely on Nancy Pelosi to all of a sudden wake up one day and just be like, oh, well, you know, I'm actually going to uh, fight for Medicare for all now. It's not going to happen. You know, the thing is, like, w unfortunately, I think a lot of the, the more corporate wing of the Democratic Party, um, you know, people like Joe Manchin, for example, they're essentially just Republicans, but with a D next to their name. That's that's how we have to treat it, because it's true. You know, that it's just the case. Um and unfortunately, you know, I, I think, uh, you know, we have to have kind of an awakening on that front because I think a lot of people don't really quite understand that our, our government has been purchased. And um, there are a lot of special interests working against sort of these advancements from happening. And, um, uh, we, we, you know, we have to kind of come to terms with that and understand that, you know, the, the, the ideological window between – you know, Republican and Democrat in this country anyway, um, is very, is very thin. It's very narrow. And, um, if, if we're actually going to get something, uh, that's really going to benefit people, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be something that's outside of that paradigm almost entirely. I totally agree with you, man. I really do think that the future is definitely, uh, for the democratic party and politics in general needs to be the birdie wing uh, of actual, uh, Democrats and, you know, actually putting out their policy positions instead of, you know, having Hillary Clinton and, you know, saying stronger together, Tom Perez saying, you know, we need to lead with our values. <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for this, man. Do you have anything to say before we finish this off? Um, No, that's it. You know, just thanks for having me on. You know, it's uh, uh, cool that your YouTube channel is kind of making strides and, and on the come up. And, um, you know, and, and, and as a disclaimer, if... Uh, if if this kid, if if six months from now, if if three years from now, uh, it it ends up that he's um, uh, some kind of crazy like a uh, neo Nazi guy that has nothing to do with me. Okay, don't don't uh, don't blame that on me. It has nothing to do with me. It's not my fault. Uh, I, I I don't I don't endorse that. So uh, the the views that I've put forth in in this podcast are mine and mine alone, and uh, and and that's it. Yeah, don't worry. I don't think that's gonna happen. But <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm just checking. I'm just covering my ass. You know what I mean? Okay, that that's probably a good idea in today's climate. <laughs> but uh, thanks so much, man. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much.